I'm Suzanne Nossel. I'm the CEO of PEN America, and I'm just going to quickly introduce this next panel. Uh, we have with us on my far left, uh, Jim Weinstein, who's the Dan Cracciolo Chair in Constitutional Law at the Sandra Day, Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State and co-editor of Extreme Speech and Democracy. Uh, next to him, Tarlock McGonigal, who's a senior researcher and lecturer at the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam and the Rapporteur of the Council of Europe's Committee on Experts on the Protection of Journalists. Uh, next, we have Jonathan Corpus Ong, who's an associate professor for global digital media at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Television and News Media. Uh, next to me is Mishi Chowdhury. She's founder of the Software Freedom Law Center, the leading nonprofit advancing the rights of internet users in India. Uh, Marianne Diaz on my right is a Venezuelan lawyer, digital rights advocate based at Derecos Digitalis in Chile, and she's founder of an organization that documents online human rights violations in Venezuela. And then finally on my right, Alex Rohofka, product policy manager for human rights and freedom of expression at Facebook. I'm going to ask to just switch places with you, uh, Mishi, so I can be a little bit closer to all my panelists. And And we're going to turn to, uh, and again, I'm Suzanne Noss, I'm the CEO of PEN America based here in New York City. The topic of our panel is uh, fake news in the context of elections. And just very briefly from PEN America's perspective, late last year we put out a comprehensive report on fraudulent news uh, called Faking News, uh, uh, f faking the news, fraudulent news, and the fight for truth, examining the issue from a free expression perspective and documenting the risk that is posed to free expression, open discourse, and democracy by the proliferation of fake news. But I'm going to turn it over to Jim to kick us off. Our panelists have kindly agreed where possible to try to keep their remarks uh, brief so that we can move on quickly to discussion with all of you. Jim. Thank you very much. Um, I had some uh, very complimentary and uh, true things to say about uh, of this conference and its organizers, but to save time, I'll skip them and uh, <laughs> go right to my uh, uh, talk. Um, laws prohibiting lies in political campaigns have been on the books in the United States for more than a century, and 19 states currently have statutes prohibiting false campaign speech in some form. The United States Supreme Court, however, has never directly ruled upon the constitutionality of such laws. And I'm going to talk about uh, whether such laws are constitutional uh, this afternoon. And um, since a prohibition of lies uh, regulates the content of speech, the constitutionality of bans on campaign lies will turn largely on part of, uh, on the scope of the basic First Amendment rule, which you may have heard, heard about, the rule against content regulation. According to um, many uh, prominent commentators, as well as uh, to a spade of uh, Supreme Court dicta, the rule against content uh, 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 extends, uh, discrimination extends to all expression, except in the words of uh, Justice Kennedy, when confined to uh, the few historic and traditional categories of expression long familiar to the bar. On this view, which I have referred to as the all-inclusive approach, bans on campaign lies would be subject to strict scrutiny and almost certainly invalidated. A narrow conception of the rule against content regulation, championed by uh, Professor Robert Post and supported in my own work, is that the rule applies primarily to speech as part of public discourse, that is, expression through which citizens in a democracy govern themselves through the, contributing to the formation of public opinion. Note, however, to the extent that cam campaign speech is considered uh, public discourse or right back at the same place, that it would be um, uh, subject to the rule against content discrimination and likely be invalidated. In my view, however, at least some bans on campaign lies 
should be conceptualized not as public discourse, but as a regulation of a government, demand, government managed domain akin to regulation of the government workplace, classroom, or courtroom. And in these government uh, managed domains, government has a lot more um, authority to regulate the content of speech. Uh, for instance, it's uncontroversial that lies in the courtroom, otherwise known as perjury, can be punished consistent with the First Amendment. In a moment, I will uh, pr propose a framework uh, for allocating camp campaign speech between the domain of public discourse and the government managed uh, domains of election. But first, I think that um, I should say a few words about United States versus Alvarez, the Supreme Court's only comprehensive decision to date on uh, the Constitution of Laws banning lies. In that uh, 2012 decision, the court invalidated by six to three a federal law making it a crime to falsely claim that uh, one had been awarded a military honor. Adopting the all-inclusive approach with a vengeance, a plurality led by Justice Kennedy for four justice said, absent from these few categories where the law allows content-based regulation of speech is any general exception to the First Amendment for false statements. So it applied strict scrutiny and invalidated the law. Now, in contrast, both the concurring and dissenting opinions, that's the magic number five, said that with respect to lies, they would reserve strict scrutiny for uh, restricting false statements about philosophy, laws that restrict false statements about philosophy, religion, history, the social sciences, the art, and the like, that is, to public discourse. But in addition, read maybe a little bit creatively by me, um, the same five justices, certainly um, the concurrence by Justice Breyer, and I think the dissent um, uh, by Justice Alito as well, five justices, I think can be read of saying that um, that certain type of restrictions on campaign lies might not be uh, might be a part of uh, not be part of public dis, uh, uh, course and may be hived off for special regulation. So let's talk about this election domain, the special government uh, uh, election domain. Um, there can be no sensible objection to the government setting the time for an election, designating polling places, designing the ballots et cetera, counting ballots, announcing, right. So there is clearly a, uh, an election uh, domain. And in, in fact, government in the United States and probably in any democracy has an affirmative duty to provide for elections and to conduct them in a fair and equitable uh, manner. So the question is, isn't whether um, a special government managed election domain exists, it's um, whether a speech regulating um, uh, laws regulating uh, election speech are um, part of this election domain or part of public discourse. Um, now, we have a number of cases regulating speech that the Supreme Court has upheld, actually upheld uh, regulating um, speech as part of election. It is uh, upheld the power of government to exclude the names of marginal parties and candidates from the ballot, to prohibit ride in voting, even when it, such voting is engaged as a means of political protest, and to even to forbid electioneering near the polls. As Justice Scalia uh, aptly observed, protection of the election process justifies limitations upon speech that cannot be imposed generally. So while not quite conceptualizing it as a domain allocation, I suggest that functionally the court has in these cases upheld content-based restrictions on campaign speech because it is in fact a special domain. So the important question is how do you allocate speech between about politics or uh, campaign speech between the domain of public discourse which it's going to be highly protected, and in uh, uh, the d domain of um, uh, uh, special uh, uh, managed uh, election domains. Um, uh, so um, let me suggest that the two criteria. Uh, 
First, whether the regulation promotes the purpose of the election domain to ensure the elections are conducted fairly and efficiently. And second, what effect will this have on the core, this regulation have on the core democratic function of public discourse, which is to uh, promote political legitimacy and to provide information and perspectives to the electorate. So let me give you just a few examples and then uh, I will close. Um, let's start with where I think there could be some regulation and that's um, laws punishing the making of knowingly false statements about voting procedures. There was a famous uh, uh, incident where flyers were distributed that said Republicans vote on Tuesday, Democrat, Democrats on Wednesday. For those of you who know, uh, uh, our election laws, guess who distributed those um, posters? Um, now, could government pr prohibit um, uh, laws like, uh, 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 lies like that? Um, I think they could. Um, I think it would be um, allocated, uh, a law like that would be allocated to the election domain because it directly promotes the fairness uh, of elections. Um, and as to the effect on the domain of public discourse, prohibiting such deception about, about uh, election procedures won't impair speakers from contributing to public opinion, and nor will it uh, uh, rob the electorate of, 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 of valuable information or perspectives or chill anyone from providing such um, uh, information. Now, just because something is in the election domain doesn't mean it's automatically constitutional, but this so directly promotes that purpose and so has such little impact on public discourse that I think it would be considered constitutional. Now, let's go to the other extreme, uh, a side of the spectrum where something would I think would be allocated to public discourse even though it's regulating um, election lies. Suppose that Beth, a reproductive rights activist opposing a state ballot initiative, um, um, uh, there's a ballot initiative restricting abortion procedures. So she, on her blog, tells the, the fib, some fib about medical necessity of late-term abortion. She just lies to defeat a ballot initiative. Um, but these lies are indistinguishable from lies that people tell on their blogs as part of public discourse all the time. Um, I think if you, pub, if you punish people for lying about a ballot initiative on their blogs, you would have a real chilling effect on public discourse. Um, and so this, uh, for this reason, any attempt to prohibit lies about ballot measures should be allocated to the domain of public discourse and invalidated. And the, and the, court, the lower court cases in the United States uniformly come to that conclusion, not <laughs> with that pellucid, brilliant reasoning, of course, but um, they should adopt it. Um, uh, but th th I think the result is right. And for similar reason, any broad laws prohibiting citizens from lying even about candidates uh, for public office uh, should be deemed a regulation of public discourse uh, and invalidated. But what about, and I'll close with this, what about laws prohibiting candidates from lying about each other? That to me is the hard case, because um, that could be considered uh, a basic ground rule for fairness of elections. Sort of like telling boxers that they can't hit below the belt. That's just a basic rule of fairness. Just don't lie about each other. At the same time, um, uh, I do think also um, that that this won't impair a core function of, uh, of the domain of public discourse. And why is that? Because candidates don't speak to influence public opinion uh, generally. They speak to influence public opinion to get themselves elected. So I don't think it's part of public discourse. I do think it's part of the election domain. But now, the point I made earlier, and I'll end with this, just because it's part of the election domain doesn't mean it's constitutional. I think that as Justice Breyer pointed out in his dissent in Alvarez, 
you got to really watch out in this domain for the risk of censorious, censorious, censorious is the word, selectivity by prosecutors. Government officials themselves are going to be policing themselves, a lot of them elected officials. I'm not sure they can be trusted to, uh, uh, to uh, fairly uh, apply these laws. I think it's a hard case when you're talking about just limiting candidates from lying about each other. Also, if I had more time and I could discuss this, depends on the nature of the lie. I'm sort of torn. I think the Supreme Court, though, ain't going to go for it. This Supreme Court gonna, ain't going to go for it. They're going to strike that down as well. So we're probably stuck at, uh, with laws. Um, they might affirm laws about election procedures. Um, and that's probably not a, 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 a whole lot more than that. Thank you very much, Jim. A lot of food for thought. OK, I'm just going to go down the line. Tyler. And hopefully there's a PowerPoint there somewhere. You got a great. Yeah, I'll, uh, go. I'll keep things moving. Uh, I'd also, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'd also like to join the course of thanks and appreciation to the organizers. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, just in case you hadn't realized it, the post-truth era has really come of age. 2016, Oxford Dictionaries announced that uh, uh, post-truth was its international word of the year. 2017, a group of German linguistic experts uh, uh, declared that uh, alternative facts were their non-word of the year. 2017, Collins Dictionary uh, stated that fake news, uh, one of the focuses of the discussion, was uh, its word of the year. Uh, then, the latest on this front is that the uh, famous international news forum Veritas Victorious has announced that uh, in its annual uh, competition about prefix of the year, that the prefix of the year is dis, from disinformation. Uh, in that uh, spirit, I've uh, tried to come up with uh, a few steps to disable disinformation, which are informed by uh, European human rights standards. Uh, I'm going to go as fast as I can, and to borrow uh, a joke from the Irish comedian Darrell Brian, if I'm talking too fast, please try and listen faster. Um, if, anybody wants, if anybody wants to challenge anything I'd say, say I'm happy to provide uh, footnotes on request later. Um, so the six steps, the six steps uh, to disable disinformation. Here we go. I think the first important thing we should do is distance ourselves from the term fake news. The second is to disaggregate the term and break it down into its component parts. Then we have to distill the component parts or types of expression that are actually problematic. Once we've done that, we should try to discern which strategies and measures would be proportionate and appropriate for the problematic types of expression. Then, and I suppose restrict would have been uh, um, 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 better here, but I wanted to have a dis in the prefix. So distrust regulatory urges. There's been some discussion already about the German, uh, uh, the German example, uh, a French bill, and there have also been some. Uh, there's also been an example in Italy, which I'll ex explain in, in a few moments as well, uh, and plenty of grounds for fearing the lack of compliance with uh, uh, international and European human rights standards. The final thing we have to do, and this is a bit of a recurrent recommendation in the conference, is discuss with all actors what could, should, and must be done, if anything. So let me, let me uh, take these one by one. But first of all, a little working definition of fake news. And one important thing to say here at the outset is that even though I'm focusing on European human rights standards, those standards are very congruent with the, uh, the joint declaration on freedom of expression, fake news, disinformation and propaganda that was adopted last year uh, by the Specialized Mandates on Freedom of Expression uh, uh, and or the media. And I think it's important to stress that uh, because there's a lot of emphasis in both approaches on the need to create an enabling environment for free, robust expression in which everyone can participate and to recognize the different roles, duties and responsibilities, rights, duties and responsibilities of different actors in that uh, uh, multimedia ecosystem and an enabling environment, and also to be very um, uh, clear-sighted and avoid generalizations. So the working definition of fake news. Uh, 
I would call it or describe it as information that has been deliberately fabricated and disseminated with the intention to deceive and mislead others into believing falsehoods or doubting verifiable facts. It's a form of disinformation that is either presented as or likely to be perceived as news. The eloquence of the first prong of that definition is totally uh, due to the European Journalism Network, which is doing excellent uh, work in, these, uh, uh, in, the, in this area, and I borrow it gratefully. The second prong is my own addendum. I think it's very important to distinguish so-called fake news from other forms of disinformation um, by, by, by recalling that it's news. News is very important in democratic societies. We as citizens have certain expectations as regards the quality of news. We expect or hope that it will be accurate and reliable, and uh, this, this makes it uh, something of a primus inter pares of different types of expression in democratic society. It's, after all, the basis on which the public uh, are able to form opinions, make decisions, and participate in deliberative processes. So I see fake news as uh, a, a a form of disinformation somewhere along a, a spectrum of, of other kinds of disinformation. And disinformation then would be part of the uh, broader uh, uh, complex multimedia ecosystem. Fake news, the point has been made already, it's as old as the hills. But its contemporary usage has infused it with uh, new lev levels of meaning, new emphases, new, new, uh, new associations. What's crucial, the real game changer, is the ease, speed, scale, and sophistication with which it's produced and disseminated. But the term itself, and I want to take distance from it, it's problematic for three reasons. It's vague, it's simpl simplistic, and it's, uh, it's dangerous. It's overbroad, it can mean different things to different people, and there's a high level of subjectivity in how it's interpreted. It's simplistic because it doesn't, it is great difficulty in capturing the multi-actor uh, nature of, of, of the present uh, um, ecosystem, and uh, this is an environment in which institutional media, individual media actors, uh, civil society, a whole range of organizations are contributing to public debate. There's an increased prevalence of strategic communication, uh, some of which can be, can, be, can be harmful. There's also an increased prevalence of automated uh, um, ex expression. All these different voices are competing for very, very limited space. So the different ways in which uh, uh, information is produced, disseminated and promoted, they're all uh, complicating the, 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 the scene. It's dangerous because um, uh, when it is used by pol politicians uh, and particular pol political leaders to uh, vilify certain sections of the media, this sets a very dangerous precedent. Uh, they, the undermining of journalists and the media who are contributing to public debate in this way makes it more difficult for them to uh, carry out their public watchdog role in society. It undermines their credibility and truth and trust are the tools of their trade. It's a Bad precedent. Disaggregate the term. Lots of people, uh, lots of people um, try to try to try to shove different types of expression under the one bar, uh, um, under the one banner, um, rightly or wrongly. So there's differentiation bet between them, and that's appropriate. Some people would put parody or satire in there, but these are clearly forms of expression that are protected by European and international uh, human rights law because they have the aim of agitating, provoking, contributing to public debate in that way. Um, truth, uh, freedom of expression under the European Convention on Human Rights isn't limited to truth. Um, there's also a, an important distinction between facts and value judgments. Facts can be proven, value judgments not necessarily, although they should have some basis in factual uh, circumstances. Defamation and hate speech are sometimes, in my view, erroneously placed under fake news. They, those elements may be present, but they're not necessarily present, so uh, avoid generalizations. Conspiracy theories about climate change, historical events, vaccinations, etc. They're uh, typical forms of, of fake news. Propaganda could be um, um, 
uh, could be included there by some people. Uh, again, important reference point is Article 21 of the ICCPR, and uh, I commend Andre's uh, uh, work for the OSCE, uh, a, a much more detailed uh, and nuanced study on the ins and outs. Um, a major preoccupation is the interference with the integrity of elections, uh, and clickbait is another. Um, let me see how many bits I can skip. Um, well, when it comes to devising appropriate strategies, maybe useful to, to classify them as preemptive or, or preventive. Think of media literacy, uh, information literacy, news literacy, uh, more longer term strategies of trying to, uh, su to support uh, pluralistic uh, diverse media uh, and, and ensure their sustainability, trust enhancing initiatives uh, from the sector itself uh, and technological uh, uh, initiatives. For identification and, and monitoring, you've got flag, uh, fact checking, uh, uh, flagging, labeling, blacklisting as examples. Then you've got containing or corrective measures uh, uh, where, where their efforts will be made to contextualize fake news, draw uh, disputed content to the um, to the attention of of the public, and uh, maybe uh, g give uh, notices uh, that 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 um, certain content might might be disputed, and you should think twice about sharing it. Then you could have a range of regulatory um, measures, which I'll come back to in the in the um, in the Q and A. Uh, is there time to present the big um, um, announcement this morning from the European Commission for the? Okay, this morning, um, the European Commission came out with its communication uh, 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 on how to tackle online disinformation. And here we'll see a number of uh, at least bullet points that will be useful for the discussion later. And we, talk about, we can maybe talk about uh, appropriate ways of calibrating uh, responses. So here are the proposed measures. They, um, the Commission has proposed that by July, Online platforms should develop and follow a code of practice on disinformation. There should be, a, more longer term, an independent European network of fact checkers, a secure European online platform for disinformation to facilitate uh, the exchange of information, particularly cross country, uh, in a cross country way, enhance media literacy, support member states in ensuring the resilience of elections against cyber threats and online disinformation, the promotion of voluntary online identification systems so that the public can, can, can identify uh, 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 disinformation, support for quality and diversified and also sustainable uh, uh, media, and then a coordinated strategic uh, communication policy. And just to flash up, um, what the code of practice would involve. Thank you very much. Sorry that it was longer than planned. Okay. All right. Uh, my presentation today is about the Philippines, and this pre uh, presentation is based on a recently published ethnographic study on the uh, political trolling industry. So this is co-authored with Jason Cabanas, who is based in the University of Leeds and also um, funded by the British Council Newton Fund Tech for Dev Network. So the Philippines is a country that our event host, Anya Scalamar, knows all too well, and she wears her hat of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings. And her work has drawn global attention to the normalization of state-sponsored violence under President Rodrigo Duterte. So human rights groups would say over 12,000 have been killed from the so-called war on drugs. And unsurprisingly, police figures would suggest a smaller figure of 5,000. So along with this growing proximity to physical violence in Filipino public life is an ampli amplification of digital violence in social media environments. So the proliferation of fake news websites, the use of fake news as a label to delegitimize mainstream sources, um, and the trolling and slut shaming of government dissenters by ordinary people as well as high profile online influencers are very recent features um, to Filipino social media. It was um, once described just like five years ago as shaped by traditional cultural values that emphasize circumspection and conformity. And so the experience of toxic incivility and unfriending friends and family is actually a very new phenomenon in the Philippines. 
So the public debate has been trying to make sense of what exactly has changed and who has caused this change. One quite alarmist perspective, and this is also very much presentist, is that Duterte and his team of celebrity influencers and paid trolls are ultimately the newly emerged villains of a contemporary good and evil narrative. So some journalists and scholars who subscribe to this idea would often refer to the masses as being gullible to troll armies and their techniques of brainwashing, which ultimately won him the election. So um, we as scholars um, um, in this network and as um, authors of this um, report, we push back on this idea. Um, such a view, we uh, argue, would rob ordinary people and voters of their own calculated rationalities and agency. What we find more compelling is the interpretation that Duterte and his digital influencers recognized but ultimately weaponized and mobilized ordinary people's already existing anger and resentment toward the establishment using new digital weapons. But their feelings of exclusion have deep historical roots and lineages. A second perspective, a technological fetishistic perspective, is to blame Facebook for all the ills in Filipino politics. Some Filipino journalists and academics have been trying to lobby Facebook to beef up their content moderation and actually take down offensive content and block fake accounts. Facebook has responded um, about two weeks ago by accrediting two Filipino media organizations as third-party fact-checkers in a kind of outsourced unpaid labor arrangement. So this perspective is probably well-meaning, but we argue that content regulation in the Philippines is difficult to execute given that the Philippine Constitution and its strong protections for free, for free speech would take after US legislation, of course, as a former colony. So flagging fake content or blacklisting fake news sites, while well-meaning, can be dangerous if criteria for selection are not transparent and can even further entrench political divides. So in our report, we take a different approach from looking only at the content and technologies of fake news to understanding the production process of digital disinformation. So what we try to do is to shine a spotlight on the industries, organizations, and individuals we call architects of network disinformation. And we wanted to think of the preventive mechanisms against its, its production process. So what did we find? And we have a fancy infographic here. Um, where um, we argue that the real chief architects of disinformation come from the advertising and PR industry. These executives lead teams of digital influencers, celebrity influencers, and fake account operators. And together, they've not only normalized political deception, but instituted systems that make it financially rewarding. So a disinformation campaign is actually a project-based work arrangement, often taken on as a sideline job. And because it is a temporary arrangement, it enables moral displacement. So nobody would identify as a full-time troll. So it's never their fault. Occupying the top level of the hierarchy, ad and PR executives play the role of high-level di digital strategists. They hold leadership roles in boutique PR agencies, handling a portfolio of corporate brands while freelancing for political clients. So these executives would tell us in interviews that, they, th that these techniques have already been mastered in corporate marketing, and they merely transpose these to the political realm. They mention that they've used fake accounts, mobilized click armies to game tw Twitter trending rankings, first for soft drink brands or shampoo brands, and then they would lend their expertise to political clients. At the mid-level of the architecture are digital influencers, and first there, there's a key opinion leaders, a kind of celebrity endorsers, and anonymous digital influencers who operate one or more anonymous accounts like comedy pages or inspirational pages that actually garner a very organic and real following while they would be occasionally slipping in paid content on their feed. And these paid content could be for corporate brands or hashtags um, paid for by politicians. So they would turn campaign objectives into viral memes and jokes that incite emotional reactions, bringing the message from the strategy to the street. At the bottom of the hierarchy, community-level fake account operators do what we call script-based disinformation work, the grunt work. And they would uh, post pre-made content on schedule and actively like and share posts to meet a daily quota. 
So as we all know, a PR campaign is still different from a PR campaign for corporate brands. Political disinformation would escape adding PR self-regulation mechanisms and strict corporate brand guidelines. And we found evidence of the pernicious consequences to democratic politics, particularly in how it would seed revisionist history narratives, silence political opponents, and hijack news media attention. So based on this architecture that we uncovered, the policy recommendations that we came up with would address vulnerabilities in the political and media ecosystem. So we tried to come up with local level interventions. One is about disclosures of political consultancies and digital campaign spending, such as on Facebook advertising. And we also propose legislation that requires disclosures of politicians' paid influencers and the hashtag campaigns and viral videos that they would seed on Twitter and Facebook. So I'll just end with questions around regulation, um, which is what the panel um, tries to um, engage with. So um, currently, the terms of the global debate on disinformation puts Facebook in the hot seat, demanding their accountability on algorithms and content moderation. But how can a global level response complement also locally driven interventions that target specific vulnerabilities in local political systems? In our report, we identified ways to encourage transparency within a particular uh, sector in the spotlight we try to address gaps um, in reform in campaign finance regulation. Um, but the question that we're dealing with, and as, uh, as scholars we're not uh, sure really, are we asking for too little, or is this already too much? I think we all recognize that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to fake news around the world, but how can we arrive at a system of monitoring and evaluating local efforts across different countries? Our second question is about how to support local journalists who find themselves on the front line on, on the fight against disinformation. What we find interesting um, um, that journalistic exposés in the Philippines have focused on naming and shaming the toxic influencers and celebrity influencers who support Duterte. But what we observe, that they've been really very restrained and constrained in demanding accountability from the people we consider the real masterminds. It's an industry open secret who the strategists are behind political campaigns. But because these executives hold the key, um, the key to large sums of potential advertising revenue, must they remain untouchable? And finally, are we able to discuss ways in which we can support workers from slipping into the digital underground? Nobody identifies as or really wants to become a troll, but become at some point complicit. How can we challenge cultures of complicity? Jonathan. <laughs> Mishi. I have only one slide. Um, um, the reason we're using the word fake news in this dialogue so much is because the President of the United States has popularized all over the world the phrase fake news, meaning the news I wish you wouldn't believe. We're all discussing things on those terms as though those were the terms that we had set by some philosophical or legal process. What I'm proposing here is just let's go back a step from all this fake news and lying question. Let's understand this is as a different problem. And that problem is of a media diversity problem, an echo chamber problem. These two are then further tied into a larger political economy issue, which revealed to us a competition law issue and truth in advertising enforcement issue as a side dish. Therefore, the argument I'm offering is that this is not a free speech and expression issue. I'm conscious of the fact that I've just created work for a different set of lawyers than the ones in this room. Um, what has happened is that in most of the developed world, too many people now get their news from one of the two advertising companies. And those advertising companies base their advertising on behavior collection. So that entire system of public opinion has been turned 180 degrees over. 
there are only two companies that define the experience of the internet for most people. We now have a very small number of news distributors distributing a very large amount of news that the ones who are distributing don't guarantee or stand behind in any way. And the real business is not delivering truth to people. Their real business is collecting the behavior of people who used to read the newspaper in order to figure out what was going on and maybe looked at department store advertising while turning the page. The supposedly neutral platforms use personalized algorithms to curate our newsfeed based on precise data models of our preferences, trapping us in the filter bubbles that arrest critical thinking. And the threat of fake news is compounded by the sense that the role of the press has now been delegated to an algorithmic system created by private companies that care only about the bottom line. This is the primar primary difficulty because the political economy of the news has shifted. The distinction between editorial material and advertising has been completely eliminated in the world we now live in. The advertising companies generate editorial material out of the stuff they get from us, whatever you put, whatever your behavior is out there. And the primary business is surveilling that readership in order to generate more closely targeted advertising. In a political economy of this kind, there is no way to prevent the deterioration of the discourse, especially by controlling free speech and expression. It's not what the platform companies don't do anything. It's not that they're never doing anything. When the heat gets too hot, they take some measures to limit access to or the dissemination of digital content, including through automated processes such as algorithms or digital recognition based removal systems, which are not transparent in nature, which fail to respect minimum due process standards and or which uh, unduly restrict access to or dissemination of content, as David Kay points out, to the UN last year. AI will now solve everything we hear. The media cop is going to be AI. And, but despite the focus on the buzzwords of algorithms and AI and big data and machine learning, these questions are political as much as they are technical. To worry about information's truth or its fakeness and fixing it by limiting speech is only possible in those societies which will allow one party, usually the government, to set what is true and what is false. It's not going to happen in liberal democracies. Uh, this is why it, I'm reminded that um, uh, the Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, he discovered as he was leaving for the Nuremberg trials, that if there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. In the 1930s, Dorothy Thompson wrote, the greatest organizers of mass hysterias and the mass delusions today are states using the radio to excite terrors, incite hatreds, inflame masses. Just replace the word radio by whatever you like, WhatsApp, Twitter, or the internet. Um, I'm also talking about the US law because I am a lawyer who practices here as well. But the other place which I do practice is India. We love regulations. We have too many regulations. We just don't like enforcement. Um, like Malaysia, Russia, Italy, and various other such vibrant illiberal democracies, we also have some recent proposals on fake news. The bot media in India turns out fake news all the time. The big biometric database, Aadhaar, is wonderful. There are no real problems with it. That is the government policy statement being treated as news in India. And that's why all these distinctions become very difficult. What is news? What is fake news? Anytime anyone wants to say that there are administrative problems, poor people going on without food, there are technical vulnerabilities in Aadhaar, people being denied, no newspaper wants to print your stuff. Because criticizing Aadhaar is, an, is 
not patriotic. Criticizing Aadhaar is not what any organization now wants to be seen doing either. That's why this is not a free speech problem, it's a competition law problem in truth, uh, in addition to the truth in advertising problem. Advertising is too tightly oligopolized and it is organized about what you behave and what the platforms collect about you, a political economy problem. It also, this, this truth in advertising problem is because parties who want to now operate at a scale, because they've become such bigger, because everybody's been connecting the world, they cannot manage to pay enough people to read all the advertisements. But that, that part, that problem is easy to fix, because uh, political ads on television, in newsprint, and on the radio, they're all currently required to disclose who has paid for the advertis advertisement under the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 in this country. And most countries have that as well. But this is not a requirement online. Because for the longest time we said, oh, these were neutral platforms, and it was easy for ignoring all the regulations which apply to traditional media. Now we do not even know what a media company is, or what a social media company is, or what a platform company is. All one requires is to fix that issue is an amendment which pierces through this farce of self-regulation, which has clearly failed us, and let everyone play by the rules. You took some foreign money in advertisement which is prohibited, you will have to tell, just the way New York Times would. Let's not get confused about where the issues are. And there is also no point in making the platforms the new FCC, like, oh, the, you are the arbiters of what the truth would be. Because we've also seen the conservatives' reaction to when Facebook wanted to partner with the Pointer Institute to flag false news stories or the trends fiasco. It will only exacerbate the situation and the charge of liberal media bias will only be flamed. We should understand this as a problem not of too much diversity either. Too many voices, too much democratization, too much vernacular, and too much the language of the street in politics. It's good for people to be able to speak. What is not good for the people is for every reader to be surveilled by one of the two companies selling advertising. And it's not good for the public discourse to be conducted in 140 or 280 character bursts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mishi. Marianne. Hi. I'm deeply sorry that you have to be listening to my ramblings for the next few minutes at this time in the afternoon. Um, I will try to be very brief and I will try to make sense, but I don't make any promises. So now, uh, I was asked to offer a Latin American perspective on this issue, and Latin America is huge. So I want to warn you that I might be making some broad generalizations here and there that might not be entirely applicable to every single country in Latin America, but this is just about trends. And I want to start with a tidbit of history. Um, in Chile, there is a newspaper uh, called El Mercurio, which is uh, apparently, it's the world's oldest Spanish language newspaper still in circulation. It was found in 1827. And through the 60s, the 70s, um, there was a phrase that was popularized uh, first by students and after that by the resistance uh, to Pinochet dictatorship that was El Mercurio Lies. And if you go uh, into whichever uh, search tool of your preference and you search for El Mercurio Miente, you will find uh, these huge banners uh, that are in black and white photographs. Uh, because El Mercurio sided with the dictatorship and it denied um, the, its abuses. And so my point here is that in Latin America at least, fake news is old news. This is not a new phenomenon at all. And the reason we're talking about this today, as Michi said, uh, is that uh, it's become a buzzword. And I, I want, uh, as my colleagues have said, to step away from that buzzword for a second, because I also think that uh, the term fake news is an oversimplification. That's just a way to uh, stop us from having the discussion that we need to be having about this. 
Now, it is true and it is evident that there exists an increased interest of states in regulating this information. I'm going to be talking about this information under the pretense mostly of protecting national security and public order. And Latin America is not the exception to this trend. Now, there already exists legislation in Latin America to deal with falsehoods, and it's mostly criminal uh, regulation, and it's not aimed strictly at the internet. And so I find rather weird this, uh, this trend uh, to try to regulate uh, this, specifically this information in, in the internet by means of a specific laws. Um, the case is that there are uh, two trends, at least, uh, in Latin American approaches to this information. Um, in both cases, you will find that information disorders and hate speech regulation are either linked or lumped together. And this is important because more often than not, the mechanism that is chosen to regulate one will also regulate the other. Um, the first approach is um, basically one of intermediary li liability of, or putting companies in the position of being arbiters of, of truth or leaving choice to users. Um, in, two th in 2017, Brazil's government established a committee to monitor and possibly order the blocking of false news reports on social media ahead of this year's presidential elections. And this, of course, raised many concerns. The, the council proposed to create a tool through which users could file reports to the council uh, of news that appears suspicious. And this would work as an extension of already existing hotlines uh, where voters could, could submit complaints to report irregularities in traditional media. And this, is, uh, this was also copied or tried to att attempted to copy in Paraguay, where the uh, deputy presented a, a, a project that basically was the same. It forced uh, uh, intermediaries to withdraw publications that were considered offensive against, uh, against um, candidates. And this is basically um, both of these projects, besides creating a, a redundancy, because uh, defamation is already a crime in, in, this, in most of Latin America, um, it also that doesn't afford the minimal guarantees for freedom of speech. And these approaches are not necessarily limited to election context. I know we're talking about the election today, but it's, this is just. This is very complex, and there are so many things happening. And for instance, uh, Honduras has a project, a recent project, uh, regulating a, um, a acts of hatred and discrimination that's supposed to force um, ISPs or intermediaries to block information or content that can constitute acts of discrimination, hate, of or, or injuries, or, or, or injuries or, or defamation. Um, it, the thing with all of these laws is, is that they don't define the parameters uh, under which these companies are supposed to def decide uh, which content is to be allowed. And also that when they are, they are framed within election context, they are there to protect uh, candidates. And when we say protect candidates, we mean protect, protecting candidates from the ruling party, whatever that is. And the second possibility is that the government decides what's truth. And recently in Venezuela, where I'm from, a union leader um, from the state's electric company, Corpo Elec, was, was detained by the intelligence services, uh, accused of spreading false information that could cause panic and, ex and anxiety in the population. And he was basically, uh, he recorded a voice note, note and sent it through WhatsApp, uh, saying that the electric system in Venezuela is, is soon to collapse. That's, that, that there isn't a biggest truth than that. But the government says that that's false information. And what matters here is what the government's determined to be false or truth. And so that, that's the risk. Uh, the risk is what we consider to be true and who gets to decide that. And here I go back to the, the, the thing I, I was quoting at the beginning about El Mercurio, which is that Latin America has a trust issue. 
And I think this problem in Latin America, at least, is a trust issue. We don't trust our governments, and we don't trust uh, media. And we don't have any reason to trust them in the first place. And f uh, the approaches where we regulate content um, in ways that are basically outsourcing our capability to decide what's true and we just we, we give this this uh, capability to media to the providers or to government is an approach that requires us to trust in the first place but also to allow ourselves not to make the decision and so i have so many more things to say about this but i'm i'm just going to end with one thing which is for me and for us in in our organization um, this is not about regulation as a single uh, bu bulletproof ap approach to deal with misinformation. This is about uh, media literacy and more than that even uh, about critical thinking. Because uh, either way, which, whichever approach we choose, we are asking people to uh, not make this decision by themselves, but this is going to end bad in, in, in some point, because you are outsourcing the decision-making process. Then whenever that, uh, it comes to, to uh, any, any situation that's problematic, someone will be able to lie to you. And so people need to be able uh, to think by themselves and to understand uh, how, to, how to judge the information that they receive. And I have a few cases that I would like to talk about of citizen approaches to this, but I will leave that for the discussion. Thank you very much, Mayan. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Alex. Thanks, Suzanne. And joining everyone else, I just want to say thanks to Agnes and to Columbia for, for hosting us here today. It's great great to be here. Um, I'm going to try and go quickly here um, so that we can get to the discussion as, as soon as possible. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of um, you know, Facebook's overall commitment around these issues. And so as everyone has probably heard you know, far too many times, uh, Facebook is a mission-driven company. And you know, our mission is to give people the power to build communities and bring the world closer together. And in order to do that, we want to help people to share authentic information and to participate in an informed community. And you know, we take action against threats that we see to that informed community. You know, for example, this year we're increasing uh, the size of the team that works on safety and security and content uh, moderation issues from 10 to 20,000 people. So you know, we recognize at Facebook the significant challenges and the risks posed to you know, our community and to societies by misinformation. But also the significant risks to freedom of expression posed by getting the response wrong, whether that's wrong at the sort of corporate private actor level or wrong at the sort of government regulatory level. So a little bit on sort of our approach and, and how we're thinking about it is really sort of four pillars. Um, the first is about stopping bad actors from using our services. The second is about disrupting economic incentives. The third is leveraging uh, newsfeed ranking. And the fourth is empowering our community and our partners to make sort of more informed and better decisions about the content they consume. Um, you'll notice what's not in there, importantly, is sort of becoming an arbiter of truth um, or a commitment of any sort to delete or remove uh, fake news or misinformation, however you want to define those things. When, and as we see, I think there's not a whole lot of clarity on what a good definition for those ideas would look like. Um, because we really believe that that's, that's dangerous fundamentally from a freedom of expression perspective for us to take on you know, that responsibility of, of determining truth from fiction. Um, instead, what we're trying to do and what we want to do is look at sort of objective and content agnostic signals f of bad behavior that we've found to sort of be associated with many purveyors of misinformation, you know, whether that's in the election context or elsewhere, and then to empower our community to sort of better, better evaluate and decide about the content that they see. So to just sort of quickly run through you know, how we're thinking about each of those, those four elements. Um, the first on stopping bad actors from using, using our products and services. You know, one of the things that we saw, particularly in the elections context, is that you know, most of this sort of bad content, this misinformation that was sort of politically motivated, um, originated with fake accounts. 
And you know, one of the things that we have in our policies, of course, at Facebook is that you have to use your authentic identity and you can't have multiple accounts, you can't have a bot. You know, your account must be an authentic individual. And so we're really focusing on removing those fake accounts and those bots that often tend to be the source of, or the originating source of a lot of this sort of bad content and misinformation, again, without looking at you know, the specific content itself. The second thing under that pillar is really continuing our investigations into the threats around organized networks and trends. So groups like the IRA, which we tracked and removed um, their accounts and ability to use our products. The, the third piece under that is sort of, of course, working with our industry partners and working with um, others in civil society and the academic community to sort of fight threats across the internet because this is not a problem, of course, that's unique to, to Facebook or to any one, any one company, but something that we, we feel strongly about sort of working together to find collaborative solutions on. The, the second sort of key element of our, our strategy here is around disrupting economic incentives. Because lots of this misinformation, I mean, we focus a lot even in the elections context on sort of the, the, the sort of political motivations behind it, or the goal of election interference. Um, but you know, what we actually see is that lots of this is just sort of pure financial motivation. So you know, I think many people probably read about the, the now famous sort of Macedonian fake news factory. Um, and you know, putting out articles on both sides of a divisive issue. This isn't about swaying a vote. It's about attracting you know, ad revenue to sites that have a bunch of you know, either malware or sort of just advertising on them. It's, it's about financial incentives rather than strictly political ones. And so, you know, we're working to really demote and sort of downrank in, in newsfeed the types of links that go to low quality ad filled web pages. So when you click something and it's sort of an ad that takes up, you know, the, half the page or the page has malware or something associated with it, that's the type of content that we are demoting and sort of attempting to, to limit the distribution of on, on Facebook. Um, the second thing that we're really doing around economic incentives is working to make advertising on our products more transparent for everyone. So we've announced that for any given page on Facebook that's running advertising, you'll be able to see all the ads that that page is currently running, regardless of whether you've been targeted or not. So you can just go to that page and see you know, everything that's being run. Um, and going even a step farther than that for political-related advertising and providing a fully searchable archive of all political ads, um, including targeting inf information and spend information. And I think that, that gets to some of the points that you know, Mishi was making about sort of the need for that transparency in, in advertising about who's behind things and how it's being funded. Um, and the third, the third piece is sort of really working just to prevent sort of bad actors and spammers from buying ads in the first place. Um, so, you know, for instance, pages that would share content that gets repeatedly marked as false by a third party fact checker that we partner with, you know, might no longer be able to advertise on the, pl on the platform. Um, and we've also announced that, again, for political and issue advertising, we're also going to be doing location and identity verification for advertisers who purchase, who purchase those ads to help ensure that they're authentic um, actors and that the community can you know, understand where that ad is coming from. Um, the, the, sort of, the next pillar really is this idea around prioritizing informative content and demoting inauthentic content. Um, and you know, again, this is sort of things around clickbait, engagement bait, sensationalism, um, not, not about the content itself, but rather about sort of how people act around the content. So if, for instance, you're much less likely to share or like an article after you click on it and read it than you are if you've never actually opened it, that's a sign that the content itself is probably bad in some way and is something that we might want to downrank or, or give less distribution on Facebook. Um, and at the same time, we want to prioritize content that's highly meaningful to people. So we've announced um, sort of that we're working to, you know, prioritize content that comes from broadly trusted sources, and also sort of local content because one of the one of the key challenges right now in the facing the sort of news industry in particular is the the lack of sort of local focus um, materials, and we want to sort of pr work with local news partners to promote that type of particularly relevant and informative content for people. Um, and then the sort of fourth, the fourth pillar really is about empowering our community and partners. Um, we want to give people on Facebook tools to better understand what they're seeing. 
One example of this is a product called Article Context um, that is, provides additional information about uh, news sources and about sort of who, who's controlling them, context from Wikipedia, context from other places, so that you have you know, a better perspective on you know, where this position or where this article is coming from. Uh, related articles, which surfaces information on sort of fact checking or you know other perspectives on the same issue to try and you know get at the get through the sort of the the concerns about the filter bubble or similar. Um, and then really supporting journalists in the news industry. Uh, many of you have probably heard of our Facebook journalism project where we're working you know, with um, journalists around the world and our partnership with the Pointer Institute on third party fact checking and also really working on sort of digital and media literacy efforts. So right here in New York, we're partnering with the City University of New York School of Journalism for our news integrity initiative to sort of provide educational resources to um, you know, educators and the public and doing a lot of work to sort of also run you know, public service announcements on you know, how to better identify potentially uh, uh, misleading content um, and how to, how to sort of not share that type of information. Um, and we're doing that both sort of in those PSAs in traditional media and and on Facebook itself. So I think I'm I'm told that I'm about at time, um, but I'm happy to you know sort of continue the discussion on on any of this. Thanks very much, Alex. Okay, so I'm going to start with a few questions and then we'll open it up for discussion. My first question is: To what extent can the problems that uh, many of you have outlined be addressed by? some version of extending offline rules to the online space, which, you know, as Misha and others have pointed out, hasn't been done. And, and here, you know, here in the U.S., we have rules around political advertising. We've had in the past uh, fair time rules uh, that uh, news uh, broadcasters, television broadcasters, uh, have to give equal time to uh, candidates from different parties. There are disclosure rules about uh, transparency around this source of political ads. How much of this problem would be solved if those rules were simply extended online? Those rules have been tested uh, by courts here in the U.S. They've passed muster. You know, is how big a part of the solution could that be? Well, I, I, I should say first that um, I'm not sure that the fairness doctrine would pass muster now with this court. Um, it did in the Red Lion case in, what was that, 1968 or 9 or something. But I have serious doubts that you could even apply that to um, broadcast media now. Well, I do see um, the introduction of the Honest Act, uh, Ads Act and also somewhat kind of a support uh, from the platform companies for it, obviously the different details, which is just extending the existing legislation on where the money in election comes from to online platforms. Um, uh, I am always hesitant uh, about um, having more regulations and more laws, uh, but uh, having said that, that the, the neutral platforms of the last decade are no longer the same companies. Uh, or the same kind of medium. They have now uh, become something much bigger, which they themselves don't categorize uh, for obvious reasons. So there is some space for some kind of legislations, like uh, where is the money coming in our political advertising? And uh, what are you actually doing with uh, all these algorithms, which may or may not be the same? So it's a little complicated situation, but I, I do think on the um, advertisement and uh, the money in political advertising for those regulations already exist, and those are the pe those are the things if used will solve a lot of problem. Um, as I said, I don't think it's a free speech problem. Alex, uh, yeah. So I would just say, you know, certainly I, I think there there is a space for you know some of this to to apply to the online space. And, you know, as I think as Mishi alluded to, you know, we, we came out in support of the Honest Ads Act, which sort of gets it, you know, bringing these rules around sort of disclosure for political advertising in, into the online space more explicitly. Um, you know, I think one of the, the real challenges, though, is that the scale of online platforms is very different than a lot of the traditional spaces that these, that these laws or regulations were written to apply to, in that, you know, they cross borders, they're global, and and that poses challenges for sort of cleanly transporting just existing 
legislation or regulatory principles online. I think you know what, what we look at is that one of the much more effective approaches is to sort of rather learn from those things. And so that's you know in, seen in the initiatives such as allowing you know ad transparency within the product based on not not a regulation, but based on sort of a principle that that's the right thing to do globally for you know all ads that are visible on Facebook that anyone can see ads regardless of whether they're targeted. So I think we can learn from those offline regulations, but that they don't necessarily always cleanly apply to the online space. Alex, just to follow up, you, when you talk about the sort of four principles, do you think about those as kind of operating independently in each local geography? You know, when you talk about the bad actors who you're gonna try to disable, are you looking at who are the bad actors, you know, in Honduras, in Myanmar, in the Philippines? Or is it more of a, a global approach, or is it some combination of both? I think it's it's really a combination of both. I think at, at the at the high level, there are sort of commonalities that you see across bad actors in general, and that's things around sort of the the fake accounts or sort of the the coordinated activity, um, and those are things that apply really everywhere in the world. And I think that you know really are in the same way. And again, that's getting back to the idea of looking at objective signals rather than than sort of specific content. Um, but certainly there are you know specific uh, groups and specific actors, for instance, it would operate in, you know, or target specific areas. And that's something that, you know, we have, again, our, our security teams uh, focus a lot on sort of detecting that type of behavior as it relates to, you know, a specific election context or a specific um, local, a local context. Jonathan? Okay. Um, just to add, um, in terms of the Philippines case, um, I think there is um, ways in which um, election campaign legislation could be much more updated um, in relation to how there's existing um, regulation around TV and radio and how um, political advertising um, there should be tracked, should be disclosed. Um, it, it is not yet covering online advertising, Facebook advertising. But at the same, um, and so I think um, that it needs to be updated. However, there will still be gaps, and I think um, uh, we currently need um, a framework to think about PR practices of digital influencers. So these are people um, who actually are um, uh, in paid sponsorship uh, arrangements um, for corporate brands, and it's um, common practice um, still for them to not disclose these. Um, and of course, uh, what more in terms of um, political um, uh, sponsorships and, and, and endorsements. So I think in the realm of digital influencers, there are gaps there. So you, a lot of you touched on this, but I'm curious you know, if you could put a finer point on it. You know, several of you sort of spelled out kind of this value chain, and you did it uh, in, in some detail in relation to the Philippines about you know, there's there's a campaign or, uh, you know, somebody vying for office or uh, a political organization that wants to direct an outcome. And then they work through, you know, in the Philippine case, it sounds like, you know, people at agencies uh, or well-known companies that are in the PR realm, then they work through these, you know, more looser networks of digital influencers who have big uh, groups of followers, you know, they then, you know, they're larger groups that sort of retreat and then there's sort of the user end, the end user, the end recipient of this information. If you think about the various kind of choke points along that uh, value chain or, or chain of devaluation perhaps, where do you think are the most, what do you see as the most important kind of nodes in terms of you know, the interventions that we're talking about and regulation in particular, you know, who should be targeted? Is it, you know, the, the, the person who uh, is paying the bills? Is it the person who is, you know, shrouding them in secrecy? Is it the person who's just a mercenary, but if you could choke them off, you know, the system breaks down? Well, the, a, a question as complicated and challenging as that could uh, shut down the whole discussion. I'll try and answer it, nevertheless. But getting back to your 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 previous question, I think I think a lot of the principles that guided um, regulation of analog media, I think they transcend uh, those analog media, and they're still overarching and relevant uh, in the in the, in the radically changed communications uh, environment. The challenge, uh, however, is how to operationalize them, and that leads into your second question. I mean, big big principles and values like pluralism and transparency, they really have to be revisited and rethought. And I think um, that that has to be a, 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 a sophisticated 
exercise because there are so many um, different actors who influence the whole ecosystem in, in, in different ways and of different levels of power. And I think it's only uh, uh, by, by, by thinking this through in a, in, a, in a careful way that we can, we, we can, we can make meaningful uh, um, policy uh, interventions where necessary. And I think the other thing to emphasize is that regulatory in, in intervention, while it, 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 it may have a purpose, um, for example, for trying to preserve the integrity of electoral uh, processes, um, they have to be seen in a much more, uh, in a much broader and, and varied context. Lots of uh, um, um, non-regulatory measures are going to be complementary in that, and I think they all uh, um, serve different purposes. I mean, media literacy, that's an ongoing, long-term solution, which will also uh, contribute to, to the effectiveness of any uh, regulatory interventions to influence how uh, media uh, uh, and information are, are, are um, shared with the public. But one thing that I think is, 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 is crucial in all of this is to uh, see how um, transparency can be injected or enforced if necessary at all the different stages of the value chain that you mentioned. Uh, so the provenance and nature of information is clear to everyone and then you, you can reap the benefits of media literacy that people have the critical faculties to, 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 to analyze uh, the value of that information. Mishi? Um, you said the chalk points. Um, I, I, um, I think there is um, a, a need to rethink intermediary liability laws. Um, and this may be a departure for somebody who's actually defend, defended uh, that quite a bit. But I also think that uh, every platform is no longer a neutral platform. And uh, everybody um, who started as just providing a platform is uh, now uh, transformed into a very different kind of a being. So um, what New York Times is subjected to, or ABC News is subjected to, necessarily also translates uh, for many of the other platforms. Um, I also think that uh, apologies are great to diffuse, but they don't change business models. There is a business model which very much relies on gathering behavior, then selling advertising. They can, there can be a ton of uh, transparency, algorithms, etc. we like it, but uh, I'll propose something else. We think about all these things as if centralized social networking is the only way to actually connect on in the internet. That's not the only way to have internet. Internet is not two companies. Um, look at the revenue models. Amazon made uh, $3 billion, under $3 billion, $2.95 billion from advertising, uh, annual revenue. Facebook made uh, $29.5 billion annually. Um, and so this also tells us where our energies need to go. We need strong legislation with teeth. These are not general privacy laws, which the Silicon Valley really likes, because you can drive trucks through those general privacy laws. What we do need is something about uh, behavior collection in interstate commerce. That how is that behavior collected? And for how long? Not for more than 50 milliseconds or something. And then what do you do with that? That's where it is. It's not about the, the politicians, because again, then we, it's a slippery slope. You're going to control the politicians from what they're saying. Then we're going to start talking about, I cannot say something, the conservatives cannot say, or I as a liberal can't say, I as a conservative cannot say. So the legislation, very narrow, not on free speech and expression. Um, not, uh, but definitely on behavior collection, the political economy of all of this, and uh, uh, in the meantime, because uh, some day later things will happen, in the meantime, extending uh, truth and advertising laws. So let me just um, come back at that and, and try to see if I understand. I think you're saying, you know, for you, the, um, the point of leverage is, uh, models of advertising targeting based on highly specific consumer data. So in a sense, turning back the clock to the era when if you wanted to do uh, advertise uh, for political campaign, you know, your choices were uh, broadcast television or perhaps direct mail, but there was no way of honing in on the individual consumer who might be uh, vulnerable or open to a very targeted message. And that if you were to regulate and uh, deprive platforms of the ability to offer that type of targeting, you know, that would essentially 
put an end to this. Is that, do I, is that a, a, a fair paraphrase? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, but to some extent, I, 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 I think yes, but I'm also saying that um, uh, the black swan incident of the 2016 election has gotten us all very uptight, uh, and that's why we want to think about everything here. And I'm only limiting, and I'm not talking about um, a, a, the fairness doctrine, because I know that we no longer live in that world. FCC doesn't do that anymore. And we do not want the platforms to become the gatekeepers of who gets to speak what. And it becomes a problem on both sides. Um, I personally would like, I like the liberal bias the Silicon Valley has, but that does not mean, as a free speech defendant, I don't want the others to say the uh, uncomfortable things, which I personally may not believe in. So I, what I'm concentrating on is that the, when, when internet and all the political economy is based on surveillance. You collect data, you collect behavior, you sell advertising very closely connected to that behavior. That business model itself informs us where the choke points should be. And I'm also saying is that sale of political advertising to anonymous persons who are now foreigners was, is already not allowed in existing laws in almost every jurisdiction. No country allows it. Of course, surreptitiously things happen. And those laws need to be extended. Those are the two things, sorry. Alex, what is uh, Facebook's position on uh, you know, an absolute ban on foreign uh, purchasing of election related messaging? So to, to sort of provide some updates on what we're, what we're actually doing in this perspective, we, are, we announced recently that you know, everyone purchasing political ads on Facebook um, and starting, starting here in the US will have to verify their location um, and their identity. And so in the United States, that will take the form of sort of actually physically mailing postcards to a US-based address to ensure that someone is, who's buying a political advertisement in the United States is physically in the US, and also verifying that person's identity identity to ensure that they are who they say they are. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, con the concrete step that we're taking to, to prevent that type of you know, foreign, foreign if, advertising. Let's say the Putin government sets up an office in Washington that can receive your postcard and send it back, and they've got uh, you know, Svetlana uh, who, who signs signs, and uh, you know, she, she has a Facebook page. You can confirm who she is. Yeah, I mean. Do you buy ads? To influence an election in Virginia? So, I mean, I don't think that's a, I don't think this is a unique problem to the internet. If you have, if you can set up a physical office, you know, in Washington or New York or anywhere else in the U.S., then you you can take various actions um, within the U.S. Uh, ecosystem. Um, I don't think that's that that sort of challenge is something that's inherently unique to online platforms. Uh, but it is unique to platforms in that sense because when New York Times accepts advertisements, it does have human beings accepting those advertisements and they stand behind what they are accepting and putting in the paper and they say yes we've checked where the money for this political ad is coming and we're also following following whatever the regulations are actually telling us to follow uh, we can if if those papers were also giving us the news which we want and also standing behind it and if platforms want to get the revenues and take away all the revenue which used to come to New York Times for them why should they not also have the the same responsibilities. So, you know, I think there's there's a large a large number of models of advertising that that model where you know there's someone at an ad sales desk who's accepting every ad. Um, that's that's one model, but there are, you know certainly self serve advertising like uh, is available through online platforms also opens up a lot more opportunities for you know people who may not be able to engage in that very high cost traditional model to you know purchase advertising that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. That's particularly you know in the case of small businesses we see that that's especially relevant. Um, but you know, even again, in the offline context, there are you know, other venues that are you know, not a newspaper. I mean, you can place, for instance, a classified ad, and there's not a, a significant amount of variation behind that. If you look at you know, ads tacked to telephone poles, there's not someone verifying that. So there's a, there's a wide range of business models for, that, re, that relate to advertising and options for how to sort of place advertising, um, you know, both, both online and offline. And I don't think there's sort of a one size fits all solution that's appropriate necessarily for, you know, for every platform or every type of advertising. 
I should uh, uh, make sure I clarify something. Although I said I doubted that um, a uh, fairness doctrine um, would be constitutional as applied to online, I think that um, I hope that the court would allow um, regulation of um, disclosure for political advertisement online. I'm, I'm fairly confident that they would, maybe Justice Thomas dissenting. Oh, go ahead. No, I, uh, all I was saying is that right now we're not even talking about the entire advertising business model, which I generally did comment about. We're only limiting it to political ads, and we're only talking about uh, foreign um, foreigners intervening and buying advertis advertisements. It's a, a very specific business model. Uh, and I do believe that uh, in the Honest Ads Act, um, it's, it does say the same thing. It's only saying that reasonable efforts will be made, which obviously those of us who are everybody, lawyers, know how reasonable it is to determine that. But, uh, but we're only limiting to one point about political advertisements and also just tracing where the funds are coming from not about the general advertising business. Well, let me ask a question about that, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to our audience. So please think about what you would like to uh, ask our panelists. You know, how uh, defensible a boundary is there around political advertising? I mean, obviously, there are certain kinds of ads you know, for or against a specific candidate by name that uh, unquestionably would qualify. But then the, you know, we know there's a lot of messaging related advertising and the laws have changed. So there are certain kinds of ads where uh, you know, the, the candidate has to uh, approve this message and we've all seen that. Uh, you know, I'm Hillary Clinton and I approve this message. Uh, you know, and then there are other kinds of messaging related ads that you know, are, are uh, in, in more of a gray area. There's all kinds of advertising we see about, you know, for example, the governor of New York and all the great things he's done. You know, they're not political advertising. It's just uh, touting, you know, the new dam or bridge uh, or initiative. There, there uh, are ads that, you know, seem like scare tactics, um, you know, that are meant to rile people up about a particular issue, uh, but that seem clearly calculated to feed into a campaign. So is this a category that we can ring fence confidently in legislation? Well, there was the issue advertising versus, you know, the, uh, uh, the direct candidate advertising rule of Buckley on down. I'm not um, uh, expert enough on election law to know. I think that's still a good law. I think that there's, you know, the magic words for candidates, and that could be um, um, regulated online or, or elsewhere. Would it uh, issue ads um, where someone wants to buy a um, uh, advertisement online um, or a corporation since uh, Citizens United wants to buy something online that's about an issue. I think there might be some constitutional uh, problems with that. Yeah. Can I end Please, that? John. Yeah. Um, so in the Philippines, the most insidious kinds of disinformation campaigns are hashtags being bought. And so most of those hashtags on Twitter, which of course are, are meant to influence mainstream media agenda, and really um, on what goes um, trending on Twitter would be covered by national media. Sometimes we would even see disinformation campaigns in those hashtags carried by global media. And so those would escape the traditional definitions and regulations around a very strict, narrow definition definition of advertising. And I think um, we're trying to come up with that vocabulary of how do we make sense of this? How can we also make it transparent which hashtags are being paid for by politicians and, and what kinds of strategies of ad and PR executives um, work into these kinds of campaigns? I want to open it up to our audience. I think we're, uh, Agnes has given us permission to go a little bit over. So I think we have probably about 20 minutes. Uh, in the back, yes. 